All right, hello everyone. Welcome to Scrum Masters of the Universe. So everybody who's been here before has seen this slide many times. You can get it to go. So our mission, we believe that there's great value in getting outside of our silos, working with other agile practitioners, really taking advantage of that, that, that community um, and group intelligence and collective intelligence and in, in growing as, as agile practitioners. Um, so that's why we're here and how you can connect with us. Um, Jeff is here. Uh, Jeff Colvin is a member of our leadership team. He is here. So wave Jeff. He's our tech host today. He's going to be pasting some links in chat for you. So don't worry about trying to screenshot or take down all the chat. chat. They'll be in your, they'll be in the chat for you. And here's our leadership team. So I'm Jamie Kriegel. We have Mark Metz, we have Mary Nogami, Jeff Colvin, Donna Reynolds, Anu, um, Anuradha. We have Marco Burville. He's he's been traveling, but he he's back now, so he should we should see him at an upcoming uh, event. And and our newest um, member is Ramya Shastri. She's really going to work with our. We're we're trying to have a presence in in the Asian market. So just to um, so she's going to be working with maybe one other leadership member that's coming soon um, to, to get some Scrum Masters of the Universe meetups scheduled that are that are time friendly with India. All right, moving on. Big thank you to our sponsors. We have what well, we can't do what we do without them. All of the, all of this isn't free. Um, so we have Scrum.org, um, Rebel Scrum, OptiLearn, Agile Alliance, 3D Change. Visigy, um, Scrum Mastered with Daria, we've got Flowsphere, we've got um, Agile Mastery Institute with um, Jeff Watts. Um, speaking of which, um, so Jeff Watts has created a, uh, a sort of a new certification. It's been around for about a year now, um, but, but really the, um, the Agile Mastery Institute was found, founded by Jeff Watts, and he has a vision to restore the industry's respect for for agile certifications, he doesn't even believe that, you know, people can, he wants people to feel capable in their role. And those two day classes the, are the kind of one and done classes. Um, they're great for knowledge sharing, but not real great for practical experience. So he's developed a pathway program that, la so everybody who signs up for, for a pathway actually gets a six month experience. You have a two-day class at the beginning that's called the Explorer class. Then you have five navigator sessions over, over a period of five months. Those are an hour and a half a month or two hours. I can't remember. Um, and then at the end, you have another two-day um, adventurer class. And then you're also, um, you're also welcomed into a community um, like a Mighty Networks community where, where you and your cohort will have access to each other, you know, for the long term, right? If you have questions that that come up in the in the real world of work, they get answered. And it's it's just like having mentors walking, walking the path with you. So it's a really great model. It's something that I really believe in so much that um, I have um, I have also worked to become a licensed guide. So my first cohort is coming up in October. And I'll be offering, you know, anybody who signs up before the end of the month gets a $300 discount. You just use SMO2300. Uh, Visigy is in the European market. So we're not directly competing with each other here. Mine are weekend classes. These are daytime classes by uh, Visigy. And that's um, Frankie. That's 20% off um, using the code SMO2. We also have, um, I still... While, while Jeff is trying to disrupt the certification industry, we still do support the two-day certification for that, for that foundational learning. And that's um, OptiLearn. You can see he, he's offering a lot of scrum.org classes, most of them, in fact. Um, he's offering a 15% off for, um, and then we have Scrum Mastered with Daria. 
Um, and she is offering 15% off in her web store, which includes a lot of pre-made templates for things like working agreements and setting up a new team. She has a whole pack on setting up a new team, which comes with mural boards and, and everything with it. So check, check that out. There's a lot of great stuff there. I think I've I think I have most of them and, and they're pretty good. You can take as is or modify, take it as a starting place and modify to fit your context. Next is uh, a, a scrum day. Scrum day is coming soon. I think we have like 20 days or something, right? And so Scrum Masters of the Universe is a platinum sponsor. We'll have a booth there. We're really hoping to see some of you there stop in and see us. I believe we have four members of our leadership team that will be here. And actually we have a special treat today because Chad here has, has written a song for Scrum Day. So I am going to, uh, are you ready to play that? Um, yeah, I got it here. You got it there, Jeff. Okay. You're not so, gonna get a you're not gonna get a live performance, but there's a recorded version that we'll show I'm you. I'm gonna stop sharing and let you share. Okay. Oh, Chad, you're not gonna sing to us. <laughs> That's why I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> so here Just is kidding. the scrum scrum day song. Scrum day. It's time to register right now. Below, and you'll see how. Just do it, don't delay. So grab a friend or a colleague, too. Scrum Day was made for you. September in Wisconsin rocks. We'll see you there for some great scrum talk. You can't go wrong If you show up by my singer song You'll have to come and see <laughs> Amazing everybody give a round of applause <laughs> <laughs> That was that was amazing <laughs> Awesome so um, and yeah, I guess we could probably share the other like uh, nudge to register with everybody. So great. Um, so we we are going to be speaking at Scrum Day, and I will bring my guitar. I haven't worked out all the logistics on how that actually will work, but um, I'm hoping if I have to just go out in the hallway and play songs or like you know campfire style, I think I'll just do that. But uh, hopefully, we can do it from the main stage. Um, I just but, put a link inside or a promo code inside the chat that you can get 20% off to yep. Scrum Day. So it's WI Agile 20. Um, it's like $125 off registration. So, um, if so you're if interested, you needed, you're thinking about it, use it as many times as you, as you would like. Yeah. If you need it, if you needed to, uh, needed help with your decision, maybe that helps. Um, and spread, spread the code around, right? The more, the merrier. Um, It'll, it's going to be a good, it's going to be a good conference. There's a lot of great speakers coming. Can you share the link to register in the chat? Yep. We have that Thanks. Jeff. Uh, Jeff has that Jeff C. I'm getting the Jeff's mixed up here now. <laughs> He's got, has that in his information. He's going yeah, to pay it's, it's in the chat. It's in the chat. It's in there. Some of the speakers, this is just a few of them, right? We've. Oh, how'd we forget you, Jeff? I think I meant to have both of you on here, but anyway, we just put, I just threw some speakers on here that are, that are going to be there, but there'll be so many more. I mean, we've got Ryan Todd. I mean, we, we have, we have Chad and Jeff, what more do you need, right? We have Dave West coming, um, Keith McCandless, co-creator of Liberating Structures will be there. That's pretty exciting. Gunther Verheyen is flying all the way from, is it Belgium? I always... I always struggle with, is it Belgium or? I think it's either Belgium or the Netherlands. I'm not 100% sure. Netherlands, yeah, they're very I close. It's Belgium, but. It's the Dutch speaking part of, the, of Belgium. Okay. The Dutch speaking part. Is that, is that a thing, really? All right. So 
here we are. I mean, this is why you guys came. We're we're here. You've already heard uh, Jeff and Chad speak a little bit. Both are they are co-hosts of the Agile Wild podcast, Agile Wire podcast, and so much more. But I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to them. Um, that's who you came to see, and let them take it away. Thanks for being here with us. Jeff awesome. Thank you. And somebody did just ask about the Agile Wire podcast. So I pasted a landing page and you can choose which platform you want to listen on. Um, but we do have, we do have a video version of that on YouTube as well. Yeah, there's um, a QR code on the screen that I'm sharing right now. If it's easier for you to go that route and then it goes to the landing page with all the different ways to connect to Chad songs to the Agile Wire, all the different platforms, LinkedIn stuff, um, other ways to connect with us, website, stuff like that. So a lot of information there if, if you want to learn more about what we're doing. We'll show this at the end too, because maybe you want to hear our talk first before you're like, do I really want to connect with these guys? So um, maybe Chad, we can jump into a little bit of background about ourselves before we kind of jump into our talk here. Yeah, yeah. Um, how do you want to do it? Well, I'll just dive in. So um, we'll try to be quick. I can tend to get long-winded. So uh, background, I got a technical background. I started out in computer science, computer programmer for many years, um, uh, did everything the wrong way. Uh, then they they made me take my hands off the keyboard. I never did anything illegal. Just I wasn't, I shouldn't be uh, uh, coding anymore. And then became more soft-skilled, business analysis, project management. Again, can something was wrong the whole time around and then finally rediscovered scrum after a decade of being introduced to it earlier. And, uh, the rest is history, uh, fell in love with this was a boat rocker, started agile transformations in the companies I worked at, and then eventually, uh, became a consultant and eventually quit my job and start my own company and eventually convinced Jeff to do the same. <laughs> it's a pretty good summary. My background's very similar, uh, technical waterfall, Agile, still a developer or, you know, a development team, and then moving into more of a Scrum Master role, product owner role, and then into Agile coaching, and then, you know, consulting and, and helping a lot of organizations kind of move through their Agile changes. So uh, Chad and I are both Scrum.org trainers, so we teach a lot of courses. We've got those listed above, just those are the different classes we teach. Uh, Procombon.org trainers as well. So we teach those. Those are tools we use, but really we try to help organizations uh, you know, become more agile. So we call ourselves agile advisors instead of agile coaches because we really advise at the whole organizational level on how to become, you know, more agile and have organizational agility. Um, so what we want to dive in today is this topic of agile-ish. Has anybody ever used that word term or heard that term before? Agile-ish. Okay. I think it's resonating. We we hear it a lot. So, you know, we come into an organization and people are like, yeah, we're agile ish and so our next question always is is, is well what is what does the ish mean like what do you mean by that and so um we got a little mural here and we want to like just dive into that conversation first so what are the things that make organizations agile ish i'm gonna put a link here to a mural board uh inside of the, the zoom chat so you can all just click on that enter as a visitor um if you haven't used it before pretty easy tool to use you just double click and it adds a sticky and you can just start typing and then you can drag it around. Um, so I'll just give it a second here and let people start joining. Seeing people coming in. And then I'm just gonna put a couple minutes on the, I'm gonna put two minutes on the calendar or on the clock here. And let's just take this panel here that I'm sharing here that says, what are the things that make organizations agile-ish? Let's add sticky notes, one item per sticky note. And um, let's go ahead and um, and try to fill up this panel here and see what we come up with, okay? If anybody has any technical questions about Mural, let us know kind of making an assumption that we've used this, this tool or a similar tool in the past.
Vicky, I see your message about mural isn't a treat on your phone. If there's any post-its you want us to add, you can just post those into the Zoom chat too, and we can put them in there. That's easier. We have a large enough group that we'll get a good data set here to drive the conversation. I'm, I'm sure what we come up with will um, will be sufficient. Awesome. I'm already seeing a few uh, themes jump out here. Uh, there's quite a few on just kind of mechanical, just going through the motions and ceremonies. Um, I see some hybrid comments about Wagile and water waterfall. Uh, carry over still in our organizations. Okay. It's a good list. Um, Jeff, where do you want to go from here? Do we want to do a rapid? Yeah, let's just move some of these over into themes, Chad. How about that? And we'll just start pulling them in and start talking about them. Yeah. And um, we can start uh, maybe giving you some things to try, some things to avoid, maybe some patterns that we've seen and some maybe some ways to start moving forward. Uh, with some of these these issues, because really the ad, the issue, the agile issue, are the things that are separating us from being agile, and so those are our barriers as scrum masters. Is how do we how do we prevent these things from happening? How do we make a change so we don't have that issue anymore? Okay, so let's. Uh, I'll just you know maybe we can start with the top one, Chad. Some people that are only following the ceremony, so maybe we'll put that in progress. I'll go ahead and find all the other ones that are, yep, um, kind of related to that. If you want to kind of maybe start answering, you know, things to try and things to avoid. Yeah. Um, I mean, obviously this, the name of this group, right? Scrum Masters of the Universe. Uh, you know, if, if we're not, I know th there's a whole spectrum of conversations on the internet and many talks and many books where we can bicker about practical scrum and purist scrum, right? Um, I, I think it all lives in the nuance in the middle somewhere. I think you can be very practical and you can also respect the fact that the creators of Scrum had something in mind. And if you only do some of those things, or if you do those things very mechanically without understanding the deep nuanced whys behind them, then you're just not going to get the results. And I say this with confidence only because Jeff and I have been using Scrum, practicing Scrum, teaching Scrum for over a decade now, and we've seen it work. So um we don't say it just because the scrum guide says so. Um, there's actually parts of the scrum guide, right? I know this is being recorded and I'm a scrum.org trainer, but there's parts of the scrum guide that drive me crazy, right? There's there's parts that I wish we could just massage a little bit because they can be misinterpreted. But at the end of the day, all of the events and everything inside of scrum, it it's intended to help you get the benefits from scrum. So, you know, the, the big nudge here is the reason there's so many blog posts and and talks about mechanical scrum and zombie scrum is because it is so pervasive around the world still right unfortunately and but it's a quick fix it's such a quick fix go look at the scrum guide refresh your your knowledge of of what's there and make those tweaks right every organization we've ever talked to we hear the same thing right we're a unique snowflake our organization is different we have to make changes to make the framework work for us yes and no you can make you you can let your organizational processes play out within the framework but you don't have to butcher the framework and only do pieces right we we know that um so i don't know that's that's my kickoff to this conversation i guess um maybe it's would... too too obvious but go look at the scrum guide you know talk to people you who are in your network understand uh seek to understand the deep whys behind each piece of scrum i'd add for a practical piece for the mechanical scrum maybe take something like the, the 12 principles in the agile manifesto and as a retro go ahead and say hey how are we doing on these things green yellow red and then take everybody's opinion and say like how can we do better 
Um, or you could do the values of Scrum. Try to incorporate the principles and values more into what you're doing day to day and try to stay away from like just using Scrum words or we should do this because the Scrum guide says so and just really try to live um, you know, the values and principles in whatever way you can. So try to bring those back in some way and that, that should help you move away from mechanical Scrum and hopefully you can move into more of people owning the whole entire process and, and how Scrum works inside of their teams. Um, if somebody's not doing Scrum or not doing a certain event or inside of Scrum, I, I, I'd echo what Chad said, you know, like try to understand the whys and say, well, how are we doing this? If we're not going to do retros, let's just say, well, how do we do continuous improvement? And if we don't do continuous improvement, what are we missing? What's going to happen with those problems? Are they just going to fester? Are we just going to get more and more upset and angry because the same things keep happening over again? Like, what's the effect of that? And let's have a conversation around those things. So those would be some of our things to try um, if you're if you're into this and in this area. So Jeff, I got the next. I have a, a good cluster of things kind of around the um, the waterfall discussion here. I'm just going to bring okay. these over. So agile, agile in IT, but not in the business. Scrum or fall, outsource development. We don't have cross functional teams. We're working in silos. These are all very related concepts, right? We actually spoke, what was it, two nights ago, Jeff? Yeah, at a project management um, uh, meeting and local to our area in Wisconsin. And I, I brought up my history as a project manager. You know, we, we struggle mostly with Scrum because we don't have a cross-functional team. That's one of our huge takeaways for today. And a lot of times it's, you're spinning up Scrum in stealth mode and this is what I did when I was a project manager. I had all the bureaucracy of the, the, the things to follow as a project manager, but I knew there were benefits with using Scrum. So to jump to a takeaway, if you can form cross-functional teams, that is one of the biggest things that makes this work, right? It's at the, it's at the core of what, what makes a Scrum team yield agility. Reducing the cost of, of coordination, and reducing the number of dependencies. Um, but even if you can't do that, just focus everybody in your effort and start delivering things incrementally, very small, right? When I was running, spinning scrum teams up in stealth mode, what I started doing is having them work and build an increment. And then it's, when I would go to steering committee meetings, instead of the status quo of reporting on... Uh, green, yellow, red status on my project. Instead, I would I brought a working product increment and showed that to the C-suite. And they were like, well, this is cool. This like, because they got to see the progress, right? I didn't ask permission to do that. I didn't say, hey, can I please use Scrum and start bringing increments uh, and demonstrations to the steering committee meeting? I just sort of backed into it, treated the steering committee meeting as if it was a sprint review. And I let the results speak for themselves. And the, C the CEO, she, she was like, this is amazing. Can we do this on all the other projects, right? So I know a lot of times with, from a change perspective, we say change is hard. I can't convince my leadership. I wouldn't try to convince everybody with a huge agenda to get approval for a transformation. I would just start doing the changes and you let the results speak for themselves, right? Um, and you can do that in a very you know professional, respectful way. You don't have to be abrasive with that. Um, just look for those small little changes you can make and back your way in. Jeff, anything to add there? Yeah, I would give you something practical here to try. So if you don't have a cross-functional team today and you want a cross-functional team and you want to make the case to leadership that you should have it and the cost of that, one thing I'd suggest tracking is the number of dependencies you have and how long you wait. Because when a team wakes up, that scrum team's run rate is 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 getting wasted, right? Like if we have to put something down, put something, pick something else back up to stay busy, we're wasting time. That's what most people do. Maybe we'd recommend something different, but you can, you can look at, it really slows your delivery. So if you look at where your, your biggest dependencies are, the teams you wait for the most, this is what I do as a scrum master. And I have done, you just go ahead and you say, okay, team A, um, you know, we needed this thing from them. It took them, take them eight hours to get to us. They're actually pretty fast. And then later in the sprint, we needed another thing from them. It took them 16 hours to respond to us. And then it took one more th time and they took them, you know, 32 hours. And then the sprint was over. You know, team B, 
We need something from them. It took them two hours and then two hours. Um, Team C, we needed something from them and they never got back to us. So we're not sure like that, that, that didn't happen. Um, and then, you know, Team D, sorry, these aren't coming through. Team D, uh, maybe that happened again pretty, pretty fast. We had a few dependencies there. Well, I'd go look at that and say, well, Team A looks like we're dealing with them the most. They're waiting quite a long time every time we have to wait for them. Maybe I go and solve that team A. How do I get that skill set? If we see this pattern emerge, sprint after sprint after sprint, I want that skill set from team A that we're missing. What is that thing we need? Is it business knowledge? Is it a type some type of system knowledge? Get that knowledge in your team. Now you'll be able, your cycle times will start to go down because you won't be having these wait times anymore. And now your, your next problem, your next, your number two problem becomes your number one problem. And you figure out how to get that skill on your team. At some point, they're going to say it's not worth it to add that skill and we'll just deal with the coordination costs and maybe that's okay. But one thing that's happened to me, like I I was on a team one time and we were coordinating with legal all the time. We actually had to coordinate with a lawyer. It was a corporate lawyer on our uh, um, on our team. And we could see this pattern emerging. And so we just actually got approval to add the lawyer on our team 50% of the time um, for the four sprints. And they helped us get through a bunch of policy stuff that we had to do for this product that we're going on with. Got the team kind of leveled up on you know some competencies in the legal realm of things. So we could actually do many things with just a sign off after that person was on our team for a while. And, and it totally got rid of a lot of the dependencies long-term um, or at least st streamlined them and got them down to these couple hours instead of you know multiple days. So this is what I'd recommend. It helps you to quantify which ones you should focus on as a scrum master because you can't do it all, not all at once usually. And if you do this, it can, you can reverse engineer into a, into a broad product definition, which again, very tied to cross-functional teams. I'm hitting on two of our key takeaways for today is going to help with agility, right? And I saw a comment that the, this is assuming that scrum is, is used for all things agile. Um, yeah, sorry. We're using scrum terminology because all things agile scrum is typically 80 to 90 percent of it um but we're totally fine anything you're using to to um deliver uh as well as when we get to our takeaway slide um you'll see we don't really care if you're using scrum um it's just most things within the agile realm tend to either use scrum verbiage or use pieces of scrum um but anyway so broad product definition right We've really got to let go. And I, I mean, the only reason I'm bringing it up again in this group is because we brought up this topic around waterfall still. And I know it's so pervasive still. Project management, there's no law that says project management has to be about managing um, schedules and plans, right? If you are a manager of a project, your, your goal is to manage that maximize the value and reduce risk. So um, even if you're not using Scrum, I would argue in 2023, the most obvious way to maximize the value is to do it in an incremental iterative way. So do that. Like, again, when I was spinning up Scrum Teams in stealth mode, we had a rule in my organization that we had to have a project schedule and we were using earn value management. We had to baseline our project schedules. Well, what did I, I satisfied that rule my work breakdown structure said sprint one, sprint two, sprint three, sprint four. And when I found out that we were going to need more sprints, I'd go to steering committee and I'd say, I need to uh, rebaseline my schedule. And then I would rebaseline my schedule and add more sprints. I didn't manage a project schedule. I really was more of a scrum master for the scrum teams. So I'm, I'm, I'm segueing into this because there's a lot of cards in kind of the upper right of our, our mural here where it talks about command and control leadership and not having buy-in and top-down management and um, silly things like velocity has to increase. And um, you don't have to let that hold you back, right? If we had buy-in, does the change happen faster? Absolutely. But you can make a lot of progress with grassroots change. Um, and, and make those impacts and let the results speak for themselves. Um, all right, Jeff. Ted, what do you, you use the term broad product definition there a few different times. I'm wondering if we should dive into that just a little deeper to make sure people have the same understanding when we use yeah. that term. 
Um, so when we say broad product definition, we mean something that um, many organizations we, we walk into, they have product definitions that are around a component. So something like an activity we do, like maybe it's like a, a front-end development, back-end development, QA, BA type of thing. They might have teams aligned around other things like a certain system, like enrollment or web or claims or billing or something like that, right? It's a subsystem, that, but it's not the product that they sell. And so what we're suggesting is that if we can start to combine backlogs and have multiple teams working under one product definition, it gives us more ability to adapt and move and change um, as an organization because we can pivot, we can focus on the problems to be solved. And, um, and so it looks different than maybe typical um, what people normally see. So typically you might see something like a product owner, um, you know, a list and you got a team, right? And you got another product owner, a list, and another team, and another product owner, a list, and another team, right? And what happens normally is when we have narrow product definitions, this item has to go to this team, then it coordinates with this team, and then it coordinates with this team, and then we can actually release it to a real customer and get value out the door. But that's not the way it actually really works, because after this team gets it, the second team, it comes back to this team, then it goes back to this team, then maybe back to this team, then over to this team then back here, then back here, then over to here, and then back here, and then maybe back to here. And this mess just keeps happening. And we as Scrum Masters sometimes get asked to coordinate and manage this mess. And so what we're saying is don't even, don't worry about managing it. Eliminate the mess. Like, just don't even do that. Don't don't worry about that. And so when we have a broad product definition, it looks much different. And so what we do is we have a product owner, a backlog yet, but we have multiple teams working off that backlog. Each team can deliver an item all the way through without needing one of the other teams. And so we still have the same number of teams. We still can deliver value, but we get rid of all the coordination costs or move it into a single team so they can deal with it day-to-day, person-to-person instead of going across team boundaries. So this is just our recommended way of starting to move forward with multiple team scrum. And it's called a broad product definition. And we think it's core to really having organizational agility. All right, questions about that? Usually that's kind of a big topic, but there's lots of ways to get here. Um, but any questions we can answer about that? I see a question about what about platform teams? Um, if, you, if you're if you selling a platform to your income, I would say great. Uh, no Is Chad cutting out for other people? Yes. Okay. I think I can complete Chad's sentence here because we work together so much. Uh, so when you're working with a platform team, you know, if, if they're if you're selling it, great. That's a great product definition because you actually have customers. If uh, if you're not selling it, I would ask, you know, do you want to deal with the coordination cost of the thing you're actually selling? And there's probably some trade-offs to be made there. A lot of times we find when we actually look at the number of people doing the work, it makes a lot more sense just to integrate those people into one broad product definition and there isn't a platform team. Sometimes it makes sense to do that, um, but it really does depend on the contents, uh, the context, and there is trade-offs. But usually the rule of thumb, broader um, is better and you want to align around like what your code bases look like, what your customers are, and the people who are doing the work and try to keep that those things so you don't have cross-team dependencies across them. Right. I think we covered this one, Chad. Yep. Okay. You're back. So uh, you're sounding yep. clear now. Okay. Um, How about let's talk about leadership next, Chad. That seems like a hot topic. There's a bunch sure. of work on that. All right. So let's talk. I mean, first, velocity must, must go, must increase. Like, we joke about this, but we have like case studies in some of our classes where like CIO comes to you and says, we need a 10% increase in velocity year over year. Make that happen, Scrum Masters. And it, it sounds fictitious, but it's a real scenario that happens in a lot of organizations. So um, what we would say is like, velocity isn't the thing you really want. Do you want more of the wrong thing? 
and it can be game so easy, why would we want to measure that? So it's more about trying to move them towards how do we, can we measure output or instead of outputs, can we measure outcomes and what behaviors are we trying to move the, you know, move the dial on and can we, cause they want something, right? Leadership wants to measure something. They want to know we're making progress and they want to know like how they know if we're not making progress. And so we have to give them something as an alternative. And the only thing we probably, many of us have ever given them or they've ever seen in the agile community is velocity. So I don't blame leadership for asking for a velocity increase, but we have to give them a better, better alternative. And my recommendation would be to go towards the outcomes um, instead of outputs, which are velocities and outputs. So something a user or customer does, trying to move some metric forward and aligning a team around a problem uh, around that. And if you do have, if 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 anyone outside of the team is using velocity, you've got, you've got to dig yourself out of that hole. You got to do education. You've got to give them something else to measure progress by. Um, it never should have, uh, it wasn't intended to ever get outside of a team. And it's really a terrible metric. I mean, we, we would advise you don't even, don't, don't even bother estimating it's 2023. If we're still estimating backlog items, if you get value out of the rich conversation, great, but there are many different ways to forecast with empirical data now. There always was, but the tools have gotten much better. Um, it's just, it's a wasteful activity to ask how much, how long is this going to take? You can still do forecasting, um, but taking a more humble approach to that is advisable. Yeah. I mean, if you care about um, like predictability, if that's what they're really after for velocity, then there's a better way, right? We can, we can get into that. It's a whole nother talk that you know, someone could dive into, or we could dive into, I'm sure there's been stuff on here. I think I've even seen talk titles where they get into that, but, you know, I'd focus more on the flow metrics, like Chad was saying, and leading, leading into, um, and, and trying to help people get move towards that. Don't show velocity outside of the scrum team, but give them predictability. People do want dates and they do want confidence intervals. If you could tell them, Hey, I think we'll have these features done in you know, four weeks with an 85% confidence level, that's going to mean something to your stakeholders. They're going to be excited to hear that. Um, or even if it's six weeks or eight weeks, at least they have an idea and you set some expectations. Um, if, if that's the level of certainty they're looking for, and that's really what they're looking for is predictability. We have better ways to answer that question than with story points and velocity. Um, so those are and the I things guess I'd look into. There, there is a comment in, uh, a message about budget. Uh, yes. So this is at the root of why we estimate and why we need to track things because we still are doing budgeting based on some resource allocation. So if you're playing a resource allocation game, meaning you're temporarily assigning people to multiple projects across your org, you have to start at square one. You're, you, you have no, uh, you're, I mean this in the kindest way, but I'm gonna be blunt. You're so far away from agility. If you're doing that, that now you're, now you're, you know, you, you really got to start with the simplicity of it form that cross-functional team. And then if you want to budget in a year, add up the blended salary of that team. And you know how much every single sprint costs for the year. There's no more budgeting to do. Now you just flex scope with your product backlog. I mean, it's really that simple. This game we play every year where organizations are like, how many projects are we going to get done and how much is it going to cost? It is such a silly activity. And again, I mean this in the kindest way, but it really is like, there's so much literature an experience we we all have now that tells us there's a better way to do that. So it's really starting that conversation with your leadership to to um, change that mindset, and then go do it. Do it in a small way. Use the dependency chart like Jeff brought up. Show how many dependencies are holding you back from from quick delivery, and then start to make small changes to move closer and closer to a cross functional team that can deliver frequently. Okay, that was kind of leadership topic. I just didn't want to leave that, that comment alone on budget because I think it is a big one. It is a big one. Um, um, so we get a lot about command control here, Chad. Maybe we can jump into some of that top-down management, command and control leadership. Teams are not allowed to be self-managing. Um, you know, I would say that a lot of this probably comes from that's what they've seen in the past. So a lot of people get promoted because they were good at the, a certain skill and they get promoted into the manager of that skill. Well, managing and that skill are very two different skills. They're very different things. 
Um, and so, you know, they probably didn't get training on it. They probably haven't seen a better way. They're just copying what they've seen other people do in the past. And so sometimes it's an unknown unknown and they just need to be, you know, they, they need to help. Right. And maybe you can help them by showing them a better way or a different way of working and why it's different. Um, I guess I would encourage you to go into any conversation with leadership, with empathy, because they have a lot of, they're trying to, there's some external stakeholder, somebody above them that's pushing them in a certain direction. And they have the people doing the work that, that they have to like try to satisfy and serve. And so they're somewhere in the middle trying to keep both these parties happy and keep things moving forward. And so there's just, they're, they're not evil, I guess is what I would, uh, I would uh, nudge us all to keep in mind. And they don't wake up every day saying, how can I make everybody's job worse? Um, but they don't know what they don't know. So I think it's our jobs to professionally, politely help them and guide them because we really exist as is scrum masters for the same exact reason that leadership exists um, and managers exist in an organization. It's to make the teams more effective than if we weren't there. And so that's why they pay us a pay, you know, a paycheck inside of these organizations. And so I'd, I guess I'd approach it with humbleness and empathy and a collaborative spirit with any leaders and try to work with them to try to get to that point. So it doesn't happen overnight. It takes a lot of time and energy to you know change mindsets and, and get people on board. But when you do get there, um, when you work together with leadership, it, it sure works a lot easier than working against them. Thoughts on that, questions? What would I suggest to start? Um, I would suggest just like, I don't know, going, having a conversation with that manager or that leader that you think maybe has this, this certain mindset or whatever. And, and I would just say, you know, the story I'm telling myself is X, but I don't think that's true. What, what is your intention here? Here's what I would like to see happening more with the teams and like try to get aligned on values and principles and, and have some, some raw conversations with them and, and see where they want to go. I don't think that they want to tell every person what to do on every task. They would like the teams to take more ownership. They just don't know how to get there. Every leader, almost every leader I've talked to, like says that to me. I wish the teams were more engaged. I wish they took more, more ownership of the solutions. I wish they, you know, fill in the blank. But they don't realize sometimes the behaviors they have enable maybe some of the things they're getting. And so we can help them with that if they're willing to work with you on that. And um, I guess if you come to them, you know, with that type of an approach, maybe they're willing to work with you. Um, safe environmental right. psychological safety. I think those again take time to build. Takes it's an it's a culture, it's an environment, it's a system that you put in place. And so think about that. Like, what are you doing, or what is in place that causes this type of culture? Um, one of the things that Chad Ed and I, we follow, I don't know, we believe to be very true from um, Craig Larman is one of his, his fifth law of organizational um, behavior, behavior is culture follows structure. And so whatever culture you have today, it follows the structure you have in place inside of your organization. So maybe you have steering committees and because people feel unsafe about the direction and the vision of the product. They want things spilled out to, every, to, the, to the nth degree, and they don't. They want to have everything documented. Um, maybe that's the case, and that's because of the structure that's in place. And so, just think about those. Like, what structures are causing some of these things, and what changes could you make to those structures? Because usually, if you're coaching, if you're helping with practices and behaviors, those things will last for a while. But if you're fighting structures, they're going to win out over over time, right? Like, um, whatever organizational structures are in place generally drive the long-term behaviors. And I don't want to lump them together like as if they're synonymous, but related to psychological safety, I guess, is just empowerment. The word empowerment gets thrown around a lot and people say the phrase, we're not empowered. Um, you may not be, but I also am a firm believer, of course, as a boat rocker and a change agent at heart, that um, no human being can truly grant someone else empowerment right? You can't take empowerment away from me. You can scare me away from acting, but I would, I would encourage you to actually look inside yourself deeply. Sounds like Jedi, like, um, question, when's the last time you did something you acted 
uh, that really called for someone else to give you empowerment, right? Meaning like, are you taking a little bit of risk every once in a while and challenging the status quo to a point where someone sees that and they're like, wow, Chad deserves a bit more empowerment, a longer leash, a little bit more control over because of what he's doing, right? This is the same thing with, uh, we don't just get promotions with new job titles and then you earn it later. Most of the time, a promotion is lagging. It comes later after you've proven you've done something. So I would say do that with empowerment, do that with as a change agent inside your organization. Um, is it a little scary? Yeah, but you don't have to go crazy with it. Just small little things to exemplify that. All right, Jeff, I, I clustered a lot around the project side of things, just a lot of existing um, status quo structures, project management roles, things holding us back um, in the center here over on the left. I guess we've already talked about them somewhat. Um, you know, we talked about team structures. We talked about product definitions. These are all very fundamental foundational pieces. So I think this is the, this is a side effect, right? I mean, it clearly we've got a lot of cards on the board here. So a lot of people in the room, your organizations are still very traditional and they're just kind of dipping their toe in the water with trying to make something within the realm of agile work. Um, these frameworks were never intended to just go across, go like you start using them and place them on top of your existing teams. That like, again, at the beginning, I know it might've felt a little like waste, uh, not very strong advice, but go look at the scrum guide. Like the, the concept of a cross-functional team and there's no sub teams and, you know, we're not specializing. We're not putting scrum on top of a database team or a testing team or a requirements team, but yet, it's 2023 and we still encounter this out in the wild all the time. So it, it's just a misunderstanding of how these things were intended to be used. So you've got to break through that misunderstanding. You've got to, you've got to educate. You've got to start those conversations. It can be with colleagues. It can be with managers. It can be with anyone up the ranks in your organization and get back to the roots of this, right? And again, we're, we're really close to the end here. We're going to unveil a, a short little slide that, gives you three things, right? Rule of three. three, three things to remember that are extremely important for agility. And we don't care whether you're using Scrum or not. Yeah, so let's just dive into the third one we haven't talked so much about yet. Is yep. Teams need are not releasing frequently. So releasing frequently, why is this important, right? It, it's important because it gives us the ability to learn. It gives us short feedback loops. It reduces risk. I don't know about you, but if it was me and it was my money, I want to take less risk. And so I want to I want to work in small batches and, and prove that we're going in the right direction before we continue to go. And so I think if you're get, ever getting um, trouble in the organization of all like, well, we can't do that here. Like, why would we want to work in small batches? Why would we want there's so much transaction cost to releasing frequently? I, I guess I would just remind them of the risk that they're taking that we went the wrong direction. So if we do releases every six months or every quarter, you're going multiple sprints without learning if you did the right thing. So that whole time frame could be waste. You could have spent all that payroll cost and it could be for not. We could have got a bunch of features that nobody will use and will solve no problems. But if we release more frequently, we have the opportunity to learn, readjust our plans and figure out the best course forward, right? And a lot of times we don't know the right way. We, it takes a certain level of humility when you're doing product development to say, I don't know the, all the answers but I'm going to deliver the first step and then I'm going to take a step and I'm going to look around and I'm going to figure out what the next step is. And, and so that, I think that level of humility is, is required um, to have a high probability of being successful in product development and um, releasing frequently is the best way to do that. So those, that's one of the keys we think for operational agility. Like if you want to just be able to have the ability to learn quickly and pivot quickly and be adaptable and deliver high valuable things, the first step is the three things that we're going to talk about here, which we've we've kind of already talked about today. It's we need a broad product definition. That's something that people really care about, customers care about, users care about. It's problem driven. It's something that solves things that you know people are really willing to fund inside of an organization. We need cross-functional teams. So each of these circles, each of these teams can deliver something from concept to cash. They can deliver and solve a problem all by themselves. 
And then we need to, to deliver offering. We need to get to that done, integrated increment very, very often, at least once per sprint, more frequently if you can. Um, and so those are the three things. They, they sound foundational, but without those three things, everything else is built on top of this as a problem. If we have those three things, I bet you many of the problems that we just talked about above don't exist. We find better ways. A lot of the things that we have above are symptoms of not having these three things in place. So if you have they, something to focus on as a scrum master, it's these three things. Yep. And they, they, they're progressively build on each other, right? Um, if you don't have a broad enough product definition, then you're, you have a narrow product definition. And therefore, even if you form a cross-functional team for that narrow definition, you're still going to depend on something else. And so therefore, it's, you're not going to have cross-functional teams for what you really want agility at. And then if you don't have that, how could you possibly deliver often because you're managing all these dependencies, right? So they really do build on themselves. Um, but this is your recipe for agile. This is it. It's been done over and over again. Um, there's no mystery. It's just spending your effort on this. We've got a few minutes left. We've been trying to take questions as we go, but now that we've got this up on the screen, any other questions? I have one. Uh, yeah. I'm the one that posted the question about the budget. It's a real scenario I'm going through. So thank you for your response. Are there references I, I can that you that you recommend that maybe I can recommend to management that's doing this? Do you have any articles? I mean, I can go Google search for this. Yeah. Are there um, any there's there, there is this whole series called Beyond Budgeting that you could take a look at. Um, it's a very popular thing in Europe to kind of have more short-term budgets where they, they do this more emergent. Um, there's some good examples there. Um, but many of the organizations that are more product first instead of project first, um, they get to the point where it's like they're just paying for run rate. And then the work that is coming in, you know, once it gets a, once the product owner says we're going to do it, that's the stuff that, you know, we know we're spending the money on for the payroll costs. And so it just kind of changes the project approval um, process and how like work gets to the teams. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Anything else? Well, it looks like we're right about on time. So, awesome. Yeah, yeah, perfect timing. So, um, yeah, we have two minutes. So, is there a last question or does it sound like it? I guess I'll just close out. I know I sound I, I could hear myself sounding like this is so simple, so obvious. I, I hope I didn't um I hope I'm not coming across uh, arrogant in those comments. I really I, I really am a change agent. And if I could leave you with any nudge, do something small. It it will matter. The more you if you care about these things and you put a little bit of effort on a frequent basis, the change will happen. And if it doesn't, then go somewhere else and try it again. Like, I think life's too short to just throw in the towel and be like, okay, I'll just work at this organization and, you know, um, we'll never make any change. I think, I think work's more fun when we're making change on a regular basis. So leave you with that. Awesome. Well, thank you for the song. Thank you for Jeff and Chad for, for taking your time and um, sharing that time with us and your knowledge with us. We really appreciate that. And um, thank you for all who came today. We hope to see you at a future Scrum Masters of the Universe meetup.